It's 9.30. Um, Mark, whenever you want to get started, I just want to uh, reiterate for anybody who jumped in after my little speech. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. I'll be monitoring and I'll relay them to Mark um, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation. Um, with that being said, uh, introducing Mark Yanshock of KipCon Engineering. Take it away, Mark. Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everybody has a uh, pleasant day ahead of them. If you are uh, if you are taking this uh, webinar, then you either need the credits or you're anticipating a roof project in the spring of next year. And hopefully, this uh, this webinar will give you some information that you could use towards that roof project that you're that upcoming roof project that you're anticipating in the preparation of it and and of course the execution. Um, my name is Mark Anchuk. I'm uh, I've been with Kipcon for the past 13 years. I'm uh, both a registered architect and a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. Uh, I've been working in construction for over 40 years now. So uh, what I hope to do is uh, bring you uh, just a little bit of the experience that I've had over the years in this webinar. So when we're talking roofing types for multifamily structures, there are two there are two essential categories. One is the low slope roofs, and then there's the steep slope roofs. The low slope roofs are typically referred to as uh, flat roofs, which they're not. They do have a, a little bit of a pitch on them. And then uh, the steep the steep slope roofs are primarily shingled roofs, uh, but there are different types of materials that are used for these these types of roofs. So I'm gonna, just going to go briefly into uh, the flat roofs, which are the low slope roofs, uh, and tell you a little bit about them. <clears throat> now, they are, they are called flat, but they're not flat. They usually have a pitch of at least a quarter inch per foot, which is uh, equates to about 2% pitch. The most common membranes that are used nowadays for residential structures are the single ply membranes, EPDM, TPO, and PVC. These are uh, these are usually um, either mechanically fastened or fully adhered. They go over top, maybe a cover board or insulation, but they are the uh, they are pretty much the go to standard for um, for low slope roof replacement in uh, in residential buildings. There are out there some legacy systems, which which I re refer to as a legacy system because it's old technology. Um, and these are your, your multiply asphaltic built up roofing systems, uh, typically referred to as BUR, BUR, or um, they might be called modified bitumen or torch down or uh, any other one of these uh, uh, names. So in, in, the, in the realm of low slope roofs, uh, EPDM and TPO and PVC, they have they have a distinct difference between them. EPDM is a rubber-based product, and um, it's what they call a thermoset. That means it once it is set in its form, it uh, it really doesn't change. Uh, it really doesn't change its uh, physical characteristics. So, in order to lap and seam EPDM, you you use a sol uh, solvent welding technology. So basically they're glued together, the seams. Um, the picture on the upper left here is showing the, uh, you know, we're installing insulation board before, before we're putting the EPDM and you could see the, um, the lines of adhesive that is going down. So this is a fully adhered system. Now TPO and PVC are what they call thermoplastics membranes. So that means when you do heat them up, they do melt to a degree, they do form where they can actually be heat welded together. And that is the primary way of, of, uh, of, of addressing the seams on them is they use a heat these heat machines that they go over the seams with, it heats it up and it melts the two layers together and it, and it becomes a heat welded system. Now, all of these systems can either be fully adhered or mechanically fastened depending on what your substrate is on your roof deck. Some of the other low slope roof types are, like I mentioned before, the asphaltic type, the built up roofing. The most common one is a torch down modified bitumen, which is um, usually two layers. There's a base layer and then a cap sheet that has granules on it. And uh, 
can there's uh, there's two types of modified bitumen. There's the SBS and the APP. The SBS is a rubber, it's a synthetic rubber based, and then uh, the APP is again almost like a um, plastic based uh, membrane. So they sometimes they uh, e even are um, they are combined together. You may have an SBS base sheet with an APB. Uh, uh, cap sheet. So there's many different ways of, of using these built up systems. Two ply is the most common, but it can go up to three and four ply. There are some other less common systems out there, an insulated roof membrane assembly and a protected membrane roof. These are very, uh, very rarely seen on residential buildings. They're mostly seen on uh, large commercial buildings, office buildings, and that type. Again, here are some examples of uh, torch down. So this is the process of, of, uh, put, of applying uh, a torch down membrane. Now, if you go up on your roof, if you have a flat roof and you go up on your roof, there's, there's an easy way to determine whether you have a single ply roofing membrane or one of these uh, BUR um, roofing membranes. If you go up there and you see these seam lines that are approximately three foot apart, you're more than likely going to have a modified bitumen system because they come in rolls of approximately 39 inches, and uh, and that's how they're applied. If your seams are further apart, six to ten feet apart, then you you most likely have a a um, one of the other single ply membranes. A lot of times you'll go up there and and you'll see there might be a silver coating on top of uh, the modified bitumen. This is uh, typically used to extend the useful life of the roof to get another five to 10 years out of it after it starts to weather. Now we're gonna go fairly heavily into steep slope roofs because that is primarily where most of the multifamily residential uh, buildings have. And um, that's where we see most of the roofing projects that come through our office. So typically anything above two and 12 and steeper is considered a steep slope roof. Now two and 12, let me explain what that is. That's two inches of rise for every 12 inches of run. That's how they determine roof systems. That's how they refer to the pitch of a, a roof. So you may hear two and 12, four and 12, five and 12. It's, it's the rise versus the run. So there are uh, multiple different types of asphalt shingles. The most common that was used by contractors is a three tap system. You don't see it too much anymore because it's not very popular and it doesn't really come with a very long uh, useful life. Um, you'll see mainly today the laminated or shingles that are laminated together or dimensional or sometimes called architectural grade shingles. And this is your, your like your timber line roof shingles that you'll see on most communities. Uh, you'll also see some standing seam roof it's not used primarily for like an entire roof, but it's used in accent areas, maybe over porches or small um, box bay windows or something like that. Um, and, and these standing seam roofs are either made of aluminum or galvanized steel. Some, some buildings you'll see might have copper standing seam roofs, but uh, copper is expensive and so you don't see that too much anymore. And then there's other roof, uh, roofing systems, other roofing products like a tile roofing. Uh, like a Spanish tile, which might be either terracotta or it might be a concrete tile, or nowadays uh, we're having synthetic tiles. Here's an example of uh, the different um, asphalt shingle styles there are going from three tab, which is on your far right, which is that used to be the old contractor grade. It lays very flat. It looks very uniform. Um, but it's, it's very bland and, and what they came up with years ago was these laminated shingles on your far left, which have a kind of a dimensional quality to them, give some different shadow lines. Look, and the look they're going for is uh, wood shakes, basically the old wood shakes that would be on top of buildings. And, and they're achieving that by putting multiple layers of shingles together laminating them together to create these shadow lines. And now they have other different designer type of shingles for that'll, that'll uh, imitate slate. And, um, and then they have higher impact resistance for areas that have uh, problems with hail.
and then all of these shingles are topped with granules. Uh, and depending on your taste, um, the granules can either be, they're all blended granules. There's, there's no real shingle out there that has just one color granule. They're usually a blend of colors in those granules. And it depends on your taste, your aesthetic of how you like um, the look of the building, the look of your roof uh, over time, because the granules, if they use maybe three or four different color granules, you'll get a more or more harmonious uh, look on the roof. A lot of a lot of the companies like that different modeling of the high contrast color blends. So you'll see on the left here, you'll see a a, um, a roof shingle that has the granules that maybe have three or four different color granules in it. And on the right, they are actually going for that look where it's very, very different colors all mixed in together. And um, and you have a higher contrast between the different colors on the roof. Now the granules are there to actually protect the the roofing from the UV rays and to provide a fire resistance. So they are a necessary part of the asphalt shingle. Here's some examples of how standing seam roofs are used. Very seldom will you see like the entire roof being used, uh, being um, clad with the standing seam roof. More often than not, you'll see uh, maybe a porch or dormers or something, some accent part of it being used with the standing seam roof. Now, because standing seam roofs generate, you know, with the sun beating down them, they're, they're, they generate a high temperature differential. So you need to use special underlayments with them that are high temperature underlayments underneath the, underneath the, uh, the metal. Also, because they're very slick, as you can see on the picture on the left, you'll tend to have, need to use uh, snow guards with them so the snow just doesn't come flying off of them. This is an example of uh, synthetic tiles, Spanish tiles that, uh, that are being used now. Um, the issue with the, the only issue with the synthetic tiles is in order to get the fire rating, a class A fire rating, you need to take special details. As you can see on the pictures on the right, you can see that um, that tan underlayment, that's actually on top of the actual underlayment and that is there to provide uh, the fire rating. Now the, the, the plastics that are in the synthetics are, have to be ordered with a special uh, ingredient and special chemistry so that they can achieve the class A and then they, you need the special underlayment to actually achieve the class A rating. And this is a, um, an example of the, the, the tiles being installed, they're screwed down, they have high wind resistance. So they're very good for areas like down the shore, as you can see here, um, and they're, they're very long lasting. Hey, Mark. Yes. Uh, I just want, I was waiting until you're done with roof types, um, but uh, Chris requested that we cover as much as we can on roof replacement repair and maintenance for condo associations that have only detached single family home and townhouse villas. I know you have a, I just wanted to mention that uh, I know the, the presentation is set, but if you can throw anything else in there, that might cover that stuff. <laughs> okay, well. I'll try. <laughs> I just wanted to so, mention, I didn't want to think, uh, Chris to think he wasn't being uh, heard. <laughs> so uh, you, can also, I, you can always email us after Chris too, if you have any specific questions that aren't covered in here. Yeah, absolutely. If if you have questions that aren't covered in, in, in the webinar here, feel free to call our office and we'll, um, we'll brainstorm with you and go over whatever you need. Um, so just to go over the, the roofing remediation process, a lot of times it starts with an evaluation of the roof. Sometimes you already know you need a new roof, so you'll go right into the preparation of specifications. You know, it's uh, you know if you're skipping that evaluation step, that's good. It'll save you some money. If you already know you're you're at the end of your useful life and you want to replace the roofs, go right into the preparation of specifications, and you won't have to go through that evaluation process because there is a there is a certain amount of evaluation that that is included in pr the preparation of the specifications. And then there's different reme remediation techniques that would be used depending on your special condition, your unique conditions. Um, and then once the specifications are prepared and reviewed by the association, you go out to bidding 
Uh, usually you go, when you go out to bidding, it'll be uh, with a pre-qualified bidders so that you know that you can compare them apples to apples and then you will select the contractor, perform the work and then just go ongoing maintenance. So in that roof evaluation part, if you're going to evaluate the roofs because you don't know if you need new roofs yet or if you want to phase them in some way, then you'll have to do a roof evaluation um, to figure out the condition of the roof. You'll review the leak reports and just have a general sense of um, which buildings may be worse than others or how much useful life is left on the buildings. Now, when we get into preparing the specifications, usually that involves some visual inspections of the roof uh, just in order to collect the data that you need to prepare the specifications. One of those observations is actually doing an attic inspection to figure out what's going on in the attic. You want to determine the type of roof construction, the condition of the roof deck, which you can see from the underside of the roof deck. And then uh, you also will be evaluating the uh, type and condition of your fire retardant treated wood, if it is present there, uh, what type it is, um, how, what condition it is in, and I'll go into um, a product that, you know, we look at, you know, there's a product out there called BlazeGuard that we look to replace if it is present on your buildings because it has been known to cause problems with condensation and, and, it, and failure of the laminations. And I'll show you that later on in the, in the webinar. Um, in, that, in those visual inspections, you're going to be identifying what flashing details you'll need for the specifications. You'll be determining your attic ventilation. First, the intake, which usually occurs at your, your roof eave, which is either going to come through soffits or fascias. Um, and then your attic ventilation for the exhaust, which is typically ridge vents, could be through gable vents, or there might be some static louvers or fans on the roof. And then there's going to be um, other exhausts. Uh, you're going to have bathroom, dryer, and kitchen exhausts. A lot of these are ducted up through the attics. You know, many times we find that they're ducted into the attic, and then we have to correct that as part of the roofing project. By code, all exhausts have to be discharged to the exterior, and that's been in the codes for eons. So, uh, you know, even if your building was built in the 80s. Uh, and you, you might, someone might say, oh, it wasn't code back then. It's, it's wrong. It was, that's been in the code for, for just about as long as we've had codes in New Jersey that all exhausts have to be ducted to the outdoors. Um, then, there, you know, as when you're on the roof, you might, you know, you might need special details and flashing details for plumbing and radon vents. Radon vents are, are typically um, Schedule 30 PVC pipe. Which is a little, um, which is a little different than regular plumbing vents, which are Schedule 40. So they have a different wall thickness, they're a different diameter. So you need special, um, special ways to flash them on the roof. So as part of the visual inspections, you're always trying to find out if the community has radon vents because they're going to need a special uh, pipe boot for them. And then there are other non-roof items that usually get rolled into a roofing project like uh, skylights, um, replacement of skylights, which are usually unit owner responsibilities, but a lot of times they're in bad shape and they need to be replaced during a roofing project. Uh, chimney chase covers, which actually could be a standalone project, but um, if you're up there doing the roofs, it, it makes sense to actually get an alternate bid for replacing them at the time of the roofs. And then, um, you know, some communities don't don't allow satellite dishes, some do, but in order to maintain uh, any type of roof warranty, there's special mounts for satellite dishes that will maintain your warranty on the roofs. Um, and then when you're doing the roofs, you may be considering replacing the gutters and downspouts, which is a good idea when you're doing the roofs. Um, and, why, and when you're doing that, um, you might be taking a look at your fascias and rakes to see what kind of condition they are, if they need to be rewrapped or replaced. If they're if they're water damaged at all, so these visual observations are usually taken part either they're usually taken from the ground level. If you already know you're replacing the roofs, just to collect the data, um, you're you're looking for obvious conditions on the you know for drainage issues, shingle blow off, and I'll show you some examples of these. Now, if you're going into a roof a total roof evaluation, then you're going to want a either a walk on or a drone roof inspection 
which is a closer up evaluation of a roof. You don't need to do this if you already know you're replacing the roof because um, whatever is up there is gonna be removed anyway. But if you're just doing a roof evaluation, you want close up observations, you wanna check the flashing details. You might even do some um, exploratory work if you're up there. Um, a lot of this will be um, kind of coordinated with your leak reports to make sure that you're you're looking where the leaks are to try and figure out what was going on there. The roof field itself usually doesn't leak. It's usually where it, it comes up against the wall or there's an offset change on the roof. It's usually where there's an interruption of the of the field that uh, you know promotes a a leak of some kind. Um, and then attic inspections, like I said, that's usually part of every roof spec that we do because we need to uh, understand what the roof construction is. So we'll go into a sampling of units by type to, to collect the information. If you're doing a roof evaluation and you're having leaks, you may, you may actually resort to an invasive inspection to uh, pinpoint an actual leak problem. If you're replacing, if you know you're replacing the roofs, you don't need to do that. Here's an example of um, some drone photography. On on the left is just a you know a straight down view from the drone, but then we can also use a thermographic uh, imagery to kind of find out where wet areas are occurring. And these are wet areas that are underneath the shingles, uh, as you can see on the right. Just want to go over some um, on a roof evaluation. Some things that you would look at, obviously, um, this is a shingle deterioration. These shingles are badly worn. They've, they're beyond their useful life. And, um, and this is usually, this is due to just weathering. These are three tab shingles that have, um, that are, are aged and weathered to the point where they need to be replaced. After storms, you may wanna check your roofs for sh any shingle blow off like this. Um, this is usually, um, this is usually caused many times from misapplication by the contractor and maybe it's improper nailing. Sometimes it's defective shingles. So if you're having problems like this, you actually need to do a kind of an investigation to determine whether it was a contractor error or was a manufacturing error. Then you might get some damaged shingles. And if it's, if it's at the edge of a roof like this, this is typically wind damage, where the, the higher pressures from the winds are usually on the edges and corners of the building. You'll get your higher wind pressures and it'll, it'll force the shingles up. And if, they're, if it's a cold day or, or if the shingles are somewhat brittle, they'll just snap off and you'll get some damage like this. I'm gonna show you some examples. These the next two are, are where they're improperly trimmed at the edges. These are at this edge, they are trimmed too short. So you can see some of the underlying um, underlayments and stuff, underlayments showing through. This is this, and there's no drip edge on it. Uh, on this slide, you know, you know, some people may think overhanging the shingle is good because it'll just dump the water right into the gutter. Manufacturers do not want this. The manufacturers want a maximum overhang of three quarters of an inch. Um, so this is actually, uh, you know, this is actually a wrong detail. This is improperly trimmed. These uh, shingles will, will eventually break off. If we go up on a roof and we see the use of caulking and other sealants, you know, the, these asphaltic mastics all over the place, then we know that there's a problem there. We know that uh, there's maybe have been leaks and they've been trying to repair it with the caulk. So you should not be seeing caulk on your roof like this because this is an indication that there was a problem there. These pipe uh, boots, you know, if, a lot of times they don't get installed properly. They have exposed nails, they have the sides. You'll have the sides uh, exposed. So these have to be installed properly too, otherwise you'll get you'll get uh, leaks at the pipe flashing, which is a very um, common area, common place to get a, a pipe, um, a water leak. This picture is showing a couple, a couple things. Um, the first thing I wanna point out is on your, on your right side there, you, you'll have these pipe, the plumbing vents that are too close to the valley. So as the water comes down the main roof, it can actually hit that 
that's that that secondary roof and go up, go uphill, go up slope, and it, actually you get under those the the flashing for those pipe boot those pipe boots. So we want to keep the the pipe boots away from the valley as far as possible, at least three feet. Um, and at the top of the at the top of the lower roof, you could see that there's a ridge vent, and that in this particular case, the ridge vent is getting a little too close to the main roof. So again, as the water's coming down the main roof, it can actually ride the ridge vent and get in into that that lower roof uh, through the ridge vent. So you want to keep the ridge vent away from that as uh, as far as you know as far as possible and still maintain your exhaust ventilation. We like at least four feet uh, separation there. Again, if you see if you're starting to see see uh, exposed nail heads, this is indicative of either the nails missed the plywood up below and it might it might be hitting a seam, or they they may not have been installed correctly or driven all the way in. So this you know this this would be a repair. You would have to go in there and lift up the shingles and see what's going on. Sometimes we run across saggy roofs where. Um, uh, you'll see a, a significant sag in between trusses. Uh, if this is occurring, uh, it's either one of two things. It's either water has gotten underneath there and damaged the sheathing and it's no longer being supported properly, or the contractor didn't use um, H clips in between, in between trusses. H clips will hold the edges together, especially if you have trusses that are 24 inches apart. And then you might have improper flashing. Now, up until recently, the use of kickout flashing um, wasn't in the code. It is in the code now, um, so you don't you don't see it on buildings that are were were you know roofs that were maybe back in the 1980s or older. Um, there is significant damage that occurs when you don't have a kickout flashing there. The, the issue here is the water gets behind, comes down the roof, and gets behind the siding, and will deteriorate all the sheathing from that point down. You can also begin to see some of the staining that's on the siding, but if they're staining on the siding, you can bet that there's, there's damage below the siding as well. Uh, again here, the use of, um, this is improper flashing, not the use of the right flashing. Instead of step flashing, they use this continuous flashing. You also might uh, run across areas where things don't align properly. You don't want to see anything like this where you have a gap between um, the drip edge and, and the plywood because this is, uh, this is where squirrels get into your attic and, and, and birds. So this all has to be sealed up, no gaps like this. Um, Mark, yeah. uh, we, get, we have a question. Uh, what is kick out sheathing? Kickout flashing. Uh, I will. Sh I will. Um, let me go back. I, I was. I have an example of that later on. That actually shows the kickout flashing. So I'll. I'll go. I'll, I will cover that. Um, that particular slide didn't have it, so I. I don't want to go back to it. <laughs> um, miscellaneous issues like trees that are overhanging roofs, actually laying on top of roofs. This will cause damage. Um, Especially if you have a tree laying on a roof and then you get it, then you get the, a thunderstorm. Um, it, it, it'll it could damage the shingles. So uh, when preparing the specifications, um, there are two different. There are two general types of remediation specifications. One is an overlay, and one is a complete removal of the existing roofing system. Uh, and replacement. Now the code only allows up to two roof coverings on any particular roof. So you're only going to be allowed one overlay. Uh, you can't just keep overlaying the roof over and over again. Um, we don't recommend overlays and um, and I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. But uh, so just keep that in mind. You're only allowed up to one overlay. We recommend doing a complete tear off so you could check the, uh, the roof deck and and put in all new flashing details. Um, the, the, uh, specifications will include, you know, like I said, the roof shingle itself 
is usually not where leaks come from. It's usually the flashing details and then the details around any type of roof penetration like these, uh, the plumbing pipes that come through, uh, vents, any type of um, penetration through that roof surface. Um, also, you, you need to look at the roof edges, the, you know, where you have the, the fascias and the rakes to make sure they're properly flashed. Then you have ice and water shield, and then you have drip edges. Uh, and then also you need a, a very important part of it is attic ventilation to keep the, uh, to keep the roof properly ventilated and to keep, keep it from condensation buildup. Most of the technical specifications that engineers provide today will spec out these details and they will also spec out the materials that they're recommending to use. Now, I, I said that I don't, we don't recommend overlays. Typically overlays can only be done on three tab shingles because they lay flat. Um, there, we have not done any overlays in, in the 13 years I've been at KIPCON. We don't recommend them. You won't get a warranty for the work and you're not really saving all that much. All you're doing is saving some demolition costs, which are very minimal. Um, so, so I don't really want to go into it too much uh, because you know I don't recommend it. And it's really not in your best interest to be doing an overlay on a uh, on an existing roof because all you're doing is you're you're just kicking the can down the road and your whatever problems you were, were on the roof are still going to be there. They're just now covered and they will resurface eventually. So the best, the best uh, way to, to tackle your roofing project is to remove all the existing roofing right down to the plywood. This way you can, you can check the plywood for any deterioration, replace any that need to be replaced. And then you'll get all new flashing, you'll get all new drip edges, you'll get new underlayment ice and water shield all new pipe collars, and then it'll be a system that you can get. There are various different types of warranties that are available, system warranties for the entire roof. And then you, you'll be able to get a, a warranty. We typically specify uh, GAF uh, systems with the, their golden pledge warranty, which will go out 40 years. The first 25 being 100% um, material and labor, even for workmanship problems. Uh, this is a just a sample of uh, spec, you know, some specifications that we provide with uh, different details um, that are uh, included. Uh, Kickout flashing. Let me see if I can annotate here. This is a detail for kickout flashing. So, kickout flashing is really just a diverter to kick the water away from the siding. So as the water comes down the roof, it hits this diverter and it gets kicked out into the gutter instead of continuing on and possibly getting underneath the siding. So in the preparation of the specifications, there's going to be a, there's usually, they're usually composed of a, some scope of work narrative and, and then a um, standardized bid form and some drawings. So in the standardized bid forms, there's usually going to be um, a place for a base bid price, which will cover everything that is specified uh, in detail in, in the uh, bid package. Then there might be some alternate bid options there for let's say gutters and downspouts. If you're thinking about replacing them, you get a separate price for that. You might get a separate price for replacing all your fire retired treated wood. So you'll have different bid options that you can evaluate separately. Then there's gonna be unit price items. These are gonna be for primarily for, um, the biggest unit price item is, is for roof deck replacement. That's the plywood. Cause you really don't know how much is gonna be required at the beginning of a job, how, much, how many sheets are gonna be deteriorated. So that'll come in, you'll get a price per sheet furnished uh, and installed uh, a new piece of plywood. Typically you'll want to re you want to request or require the quantities for each each of your buildings to be listed. 
And the reason for that is, is then you can compare contractors' quantities to make sure that somebody just didn't miss the boat on, on the, the number of uh, squares of shingles that there are going to be installed. Some of the extra work, kind of roof-related, but not, are, you know, skylights, attic fans, chimney chimney caps, satellite dishes, and additional ice and water shields. So these are usually rolled into a roofing project, although they're not per se part of the, sh the shingles themselves. <laughs> so on the comparison of the bids, you'll you'll have your standardized bid forms. Usually you will get the, the bids in from pre-qualified contractors. So we're able to create um, spreadsheets. You know, if you have a standardized bid form, you could create a spreadsheet and, uh, and allow a direct comparison apples to apples from contractor to contractor and then rank them. And then you'll also want to separate the base bid cost from the cost of the option. So you'll want to evaluate their base bid cost and rank them that way. And then look at their cost of the extras and the options because sometimes they may have a high unit price for plywood replacement. And if your job has a lot of plywood that needs to be replaced, that's going to impact the overall cost versus a contractor who might have a slightly higher base bid cost, but then their unit cost for plywood is much lower. So you have to evaluate both. Um, and then you're going to have to estimate, you know, contingencies for, for extra work because they're on all remediation jobs. There's going to be work that's unforeseen count on it. So you always want to, you know, put some sort of contingency in there, uh, kind of a basic contingency is that say 15% of, uh, the base bid costs, you know, that'll get, that'll cover most items that are extra work, unless it's something extraordinary. If you're, if you're developing a project budget, you'll have to put in also some cost for permits that can range anywhere from a half percent to 3% of the, of the, um, contract at work. And then if you're going to have the, an engineer do some oversight, you'll, you, should, you should budget for that as well. When you, when you are comparing the bids, and let's say you're narrowing it down to maybe two bidders, you may want to bring in the, these uh, two bidders, the two contractors, and then interview them to see which one you, you, you might have a better rapport with, even, even if the one price is higher than the other. So when you're evaluating and selecting a contractor, it's not always about price. Um, many times it is if the contractors are pre-qualified, you can just go basically, you know, just go on price if you feel comfortable with that. Um, and maybe after the interview, you feel you, you'll spend a little bit more because you have a better rapport with the, one of the other contractors. But then you want to also evaluate the schedule that they're proposing, um, the experience that they have with the working in communities, and you'll you may want to check their references, uh, especially for maybe some projects that they were recently working on, and get some uh, references. Now, when you're performing the work, after you selected a contractor and executed a contract, um, and you have the agreement in place, the first thing you want to do is conduct a pre-construction meeting with the contractor on site. With all parties, that, that includes uh, the contractor, the engineer, if they're doing the oversight, um, board members if they want, and, and management company. And you usually want to walk the site, and you're going to be looking for the logistics of the project, where dumpsters are going to go, how much parking is going to be taken up, where you're going to start staging uh, staging materials. And um, and hopefully, uh, you know, you'll also be looking at vegetation, trees that need to be trimmed, all that type of things to, 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 to get uh, ready for your roofing project. Residents need to be um, notified. It's um, either, either you're going to have a town hall meeting or you're going to send out a blast email. Um, but they need to be notified in advance of this disruption to their lives. Uh, usually there's a long range notification, maybe a month out saying like roofing project is coming. And then there's a short range, and this is usually supplied by the contractor themselves. Usually a week before they're going to start a building, they will they will hang notices on the building to say we're you know we're getting ready for um, the roofing project next week, and this is what you need to know. Um, and then usually that'll also on that notice there's going to be telephone numbers that you can call in case there's a problem. And then this is also to keep expectations reasonable with the 
with the residents, there is going to be some disruption to their lives. Luckily, on uh, roofing projects, they go very fast. I've never seen a you know a build you know large buildings could probably be done within a week. You know, if it's a, if it's maybe a, a, a smaller building, there's maybe four to six townhomes in there. It might be done in three to four days. So, luckily, roofing projects go very fast. Now, the role of the engineer, if you're contracting for oversight, is to to be on site to uh, to determine the general conformance with specifications. That's to make sure that all the materials that were specified are there, all the details are being adhered to um, as applicable to that project, and then to, to address any and give directive to any anything that comes up in the field that, that they may not have been covered in the specifications. And there will be things that are not covered in the specifications because no specification will have every little detail in it it's just impossible to do or the specification would be very costly to do that so there's going to be things that need to be worked out in the field with the contractor and if the engineer is there they could usually do it on the spot and then um and then the, the engineer would also approve any work that's outside of the base contract this is uh, the extra work, you know, the replacing the plywood, how many sheets of plywood needed to be replaced. They'll verify that, yeah, they needed to be replaced. They were damaged. So that type of um, that type of approval. Um, and then when it comes to paying the contractor, they would be the first ones to review the, the applications for payment to make sure that that building was indeed substantially complete and uh, that you could pay. You can pay 90% of the bill, hold back the retainage till the end of the job. And then the uh, the engineer is also the liaison with the contractor and the board, kind of the, the in between person, to um, to provide guidance to the board and and both the the board and the contractor. And then to uh, do obviously inspections to you know at the at, when the contractor says that they're substantially complete to actually go in there and inspect it to see for any punch list items. And then at the at the end, when your roof is all done, you just need to perform regular visual inspections of the roofs. Make sure that there's no shingle blow off. There's nothing, there's nothing, um, you know, missing up there or, or or bulging or or anything like that. You just need to maintain the building. Make sure the leaves get cleaned off the building. Replace any damaged shingles. Keep the trees off. Keep the gutters clean on a regular basis. That's at least twice a year. And uh, and then you should have a a a roof that'll last you for years. Um, at this point, <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you the code word for the presentation, and that is a uh, drip edge. So when you when you go to get your certificates, uh, you'll need that that code word. Just so jot it down. It's a uh, drip edge. And I am writing my uh, email address in the chat right now, so you can email that to me to get your certificate. Thank you. So. Uh, the last part of the presentation, now I'm going to go through briefly to show you some examples of a typical day in a roofing project um, from recent projects. Uh, so this is not from just one single project. I took examples from multiple different projects that kind of uh, show um, what a day would be like. And all, all roofing project days are pretty much similar because um, the, the roofers will will take off only as much as they could cover in one day. So a roofing crew of let's say 10, they might work on uh, 30 squares a day and be able to, uh, to tear off, fix the plywood, do the flashing details, underlayments and install the roof in one day. And usually um, they'll uh, cover up everything that they've uncovered for that one day. So starting at, now, just starting probably a couple of days before the roof, roofing project starts, you'll have a mobilization period. And that's when the contractor will start to uh, bring stuff to the site. This is all very typical. You'll have pallet storage for the shingles. You'll have a dumpster. You'll have a portage on there. And then you'll, you'll have a, a container, maybe not as large as this one, for all the small items that, um, you know, the pipe boots and all that, that need to be um, locked up so that they don't... Um, they don't get stolen, basically. Um, and then you're going to have some some parking for the contractors when they show up. So 
So work starts at 730. They're going to prep the roof for demolition. They'll be, you know, they're, they're, you know, if access to the roof isn't available so they could get it, we're using a telescoping uh, boom truck. Uh, they'll drape, they'll drape the tarps down. They'll put plywood up against shrubs and, and glass so they don't get damaged. And they're getting ready to tear off the roof. You know, when they start to tear off the roof, it gets pretty messy. They'll have probably someone on the ground starting to collect the stuff. So this is a, you know, this is disruption. This is, this is something you got to expect. So on a complete tear off, it is exactly as it sounds. They're, they're going right down to plywood, taking everything off, everything off and over the edge of the uh, edge of the roof. Here you can see as they're doing that, you're also looking at the plywood to see if there's any damaged plywood. Some companies may, you know, if they have access to the roof from the road, they'll, they'll use a, a, a piece of equipment like this. So th this would need to be stored on the site as well. This is a telescoping um, lift, forklift, which in this particular case is they have a pl plywood box on front of it that they use. They'll They'll raise up to the roof and they'll, They'll put all the shingles in that and then bring it over to the dumpster. That same piece of equipment is used to bring stuff onto the roof, as, as can be seen here. So they're loading the roof with the, the different underlayments and uh, flashing material. Some companies may also, if the dumpster is not located close to the roof that they're working on, mainly because of site logistics, They'll uh, they'll use a, they'll use a, a piece of equipment like this. This is what they they call an equipter. So it's basically a buggy for debris. They'll load it up. They'll bring it over to the dumpster and they'll and they'll uh, they'll transport the shingles, the, the, the demolished debris that way. Especially if the dumpster is not close to them. Now I talked to I, I said I referred earlier to a product called BlazeGuard Fire Retard Treated plywood this product uh early back in the early 90s new jersey had a very large program where all the fire treated wood was being replaced in new jersey because there were um, manufacturing issues with it it was delaminating um and there were two basic products that were being installed at that time one was called drycon which is still which i don't think is around anymore but it was around up until last year uh, and then there's this product called BlazeGuard that was used as the replacement for the deteriorating um, plywood. Now, this this product had a laminated sheet on it on the underside. And as we found over time, this product is not holding up well either. So this product, uh, what we see is there's condensation issues with it. There's also, as you can see here in this picture, it has it is completely delaminating and deteriorating, you're losing your, as, as this deteriorates like this, you're losing your fire protection uh, for that plywood. So it now is just, it's no better than just a regular piece of plywood. So up against that firewall, it's not providing the protection it should be. Any project that we get involved with and we see blaze guard there, we, we are replacing, we highly recommending it um, and then in, and then we are going through the process of replacing it with some of the newer products, uh, or the, the newer um, treatments, fire, fire, you know, the, um, the fire retired treated woods are much better. They're, they're much more stable and they're replacing it with them. A lot of times on roofing projects, you may run across not just bad sheathing, but bad rafters that are starting to wander. Uh, so there might be some structural damage so as, as you're going through on the roofing project, you'll, you'll uncover this. You know, if you did an overlay, you would never see this. Um, and then, uh, you know, right at the same time you're doing the roof, you, you can't lose step with any of this. So you'll have unit prices for, for different items. And in this particular case, those structural repairs are done like on the spot. So we could get the roof back on the same day. For... For intake for attic ventilation, if you if you have vented soffits and you have insulation in the attic, you need to provide a gap between the insulation and the underside of the sheathing so that the airflow can get up into the attic. A lot of the older homes, 
that we're finding don't have what we call these insulation baffles. Uh, so we'll, we'll, as part of the roofing project, if they're not there, and we'll know that when we do the attic inspection, um, we, we are requiring that uh, these insulation baffles be installed. All, on all of these roofing projects, the roofers do not have to go through the unit to get into the attic. They'll just take a piece of plywood off, as, as can be seen here, and they'll hop into the attic that way. So that in that respect, there's no disruption to the residents from going through the units because access to the attic will be from the outside. When we're doing our attic inspection, sometimes we'll come across combined exhaust vents. This, you know, this is not a good condition. Anytime we see this, we will correct it by separating the vents. The problem you have with something like this is uh, you'll get backdrafts from, if one is on and the other isn't, you'll get uh, the pressure from the one pushing the exhaust into the ductwork for the other. So you never, especially because these, these, you know, seldom have backdraft preventers on them. So these will be corrected, they'll be separated and they'll be vented separately through the roof. This is a, just a picture of um, them in, in installing the um, ductwork for bathroom vents. Bathroom vents can be flex. And in this particular case, they're insulated flex duct. Um, if it's a dryer vent, it has to be hard, hard ducted. So in the attic, you might see something like this. You'll have uh, your flex duct, which is usually bathroom vents. You'll have your hard duct, which is usually dryer vents. And then on the on the far left here, you might have something that's bigger and galvanized. That'll be probably a, a your furnace vent, a, a, what they call a B vent. Um, as you notice, the flex duct will come down. These are your bathroom vents. Typically, they'll come down. They'll come down with a drop, and then there will be a horizontal run to it. That's just in case any condensation builds up in them. You don't want that to have a vertical drop right into your exhaust fan um, because the condensation might actually come out through your exhaust. So you always want to have like a section of horizontal involved so the condensation can, it can uh, uh, you know, accumulate there and, and then dissipate. So now that the roof is cleared off, uh, you're going to start and you replace whatever plywood needed to be replaced and you started uh, getting the positions for your bathroom exhaust fans. Uh, you're going to start with uh, installing the underlayments. So the first thing that goes on is the drip edge along the eave. And then you'll, you'll do your leak barrier along the eave, and then you'll start doing your underlayments. If there's any side, what we call sidewalls, and that's where any wall, any roof got, uh, butts up against a rising wall like this, the siding will have to come off there so we can, do, we can, we can flash the roof in. Now, this is a, a ice and water shield going up against that sidewall. It's a 36-inch roll. Half of, half of it will go up, and half of it will come on the roof. If you notice here, that ice and water shield goes on top of the underlayment. So this is a typical installation for, um, for higher performing roofs. So this is a very, uh, the sidewalls are a very common place where leaks occur. So you wanna flash it as, as best you can. So this goes on under the uh, building paper that will go on and uh, then the siding will go back up. This is just as an example of, um, um, you know, you'll, you, you'll probably have two rows of ice and water shield at the eave, and then, and then you'll be putting the underlayments. Uh, if you notice here, they stop it short from the, the edges of the building, and that's so they could put the underlayment, the ice and water shield up the rakes. And I'll show you an exa example of that later. This is just the underlayments going on. There's different types of underlayment. This is a, an asphalt-based underlayment for this project. This, this photo is showing that, you know, when you're doing the, um, the demolition, there's also going to be, they're also going to check for the ridge vent. If you notice in this particular picture, the ridge vent stops short of the edge. Um, and that's common. You don't want the ridge vent to go all the way to the edge. Uh, if there's a firewall there, it has to be set back at least four feet because you don't have, you don't want to have anything in that within four feet of a firewall. So leak barrier um, locations. So typically, um, the most common area that people understand where these leak barriers or ice and water shield go are on the eaves, but they should also be going up the rakes because wind-driven rain will get in at your uh, along your rakes, and valleys are another area of um, 
that it's prone to leaks. So you should have your eaves, your rakes, and your valleys all with the ice and water shield. Now this picture is also showing that uh, the chimneys there, they have to be stripped somewhat to get the, the flashing up the chimney. And as you can see at the base of that chimney, there's a there's kick out flashing. So this picture is actually showing uh, flashing going up the sidewalls, up the chimneys, kick out flashing, uh, and the um, ice and water shield going up the rake with the drip edge. So there's a lot of things going on in this picture going on at the same time. This is the installation of a, a drip edge, of the drip edges. First, there's the drip edge along the, on the eave, which actually then is lapped over by the ice and water shield. When you're installing, then after the, the ice and water shield get installed, that's when you're starting the shingle process. That's when you start to put the drip edge along the rake, and that actually goes over the ice and water shield and then over the drip edge from at the bottom. So there's there's a layering method to all of this that has to be, adhere to and if you have the engineer on the site and these are all going to be in the specifications if the engineer is on the site they will be checking that this gets done properly chimney chases are notorious leakers one of the reasons is that the builders don't pay much attention to them a lot of times we'll run across chimney chases that don't even have building paper on them so they have to be totally stripped like this one is and then flashed properly front and back and then um new building paper put on there and, and then the siding reinstalled. The back side of the chimney always has a cricket and that has to be that has to be totally uh, you know um, protected with ice and water shield because that is a one of the main sources of a leak. So after what I what I just showed you was the demolition and the installate you know demolition replacement of plywoods, prepping for the exhaust fans, installation of ice and water shield and the underlayments. That all occurs in the morning of a typical day. And then by noontime, they're starting to load the roof with the shingles. And then at that point, around lunchtime, might be 12, one o'clock, depending on how much work is being done. You'll see something like this, where all the underlayments are down and uh, the roof is loaded for the shingles. This is usually the breaking point where most most roofers will break for lunch and then come back after lunch to start installing the shingles. That the shingle installation goes fairly quick and 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 GAF like most other uh, manufacturers they uh, they require this the stair step method. They don't wa want the the shingles to be put up in a straight vertical row. They call that racking because the seams will line up. What they want to do is they want to do it in the stair step so it staggers all the seams going down the roof. While the shingles are being installed, that's when a lot of your accessories get installed and flashed in. This is a bathroom vent being installed and then there's a there's leak barrier under it. The reason why it has to be installed with the shingles is because the front part of it laps over the shingle and then the back part of it gets lapped by the shingle and then there's flashing underneath. So it has to be installed at the time of the shingles. The same with your plumbing boots. This is a picture of both a plumbing boot on your left and on your right is a radon vent that has this special um, sleeve over it because it has its uh, 30 schedule uh, PVC. Also going on at the same time as your shingles are being installed are your step flashing along the side walls. These have to be installed with the shingle they get nailed at the same time. So that flashing gets done, that gets put over the ice and water shield, and then will be lapped over by the building paper eventually. And here's that process going on. You can see this, you can see the ice and water shield is in place and, this, and the step flashing is getting installed with the shingles. A lot of times the, uh, the rake drip edges are getting installed with the shingles as you can see here. And then, and then, and then there's two types of chimneys. There's a, a wood frame chimney and then a brick chimney. They, there's different details for that. Um, here, the flashing is going up the brick chimney to a point where you can see a, you can see an indentation in the brick. This is what we call a reglet that's cut into the brick. Now the counter flashing will be tucked into there and sealed and then going over all the um, step flashing. 
this is a picture of a kickout flashing that's uh, that's installed at the time of the shingles. And it's as you can see, it's there to divert the water away from getting behind the, the, the siding. So after all of that is done, uh, then process of the siders have to come in here and start putting the siding back, putting the building paper building paper down, the Tyvek, and then putting all the shingles back that they took off. Even little roofs. Um, this is a box bay window. You know, you can't just replace the shingles on there. You have to replace, you have to take the siding off. You have to flash it properly. This is what we call a head wall. So it gets continuous flashing along the, the top there. And then uh, it has to be flashed with the ice and water shield, then the continuous flashing, and then the siding has to be put back on. Even on stucco projects with the, or EFIS, you know, that has to be cut and then uh, flashed properly and then, then the uh, stucco can be replaced. Um, if, you, if your project has uh, uh, something like this, these are perforated soffit vents. This is your, your main intake for your attic ventilation. A lot of times what we'll find if it's an older community, They'll have maybe a maybe a vinyl soffit, but it it's covering um, plywood that was probably the original soffit. So you have to also investigate this to make sure that they didn't cover over plywood, because there's the vented soffit's not doing any good if it's if it's just if it's just uh, hiding the plywood that's above it. So you have to make sure that the soffits are are venting properly. And uh, some, in a lot of roofing projects, sometimes those soffits are replaced. Chimney caps. There's two types of chimney caps. These are the metal ones. Usually, if it's a, an original one from the from the builder, it's going to be a galvanized chimney cap that is probably looking like this by now, if it's 30 years old. And uh, you can see it's starting. You know, some of these are rusted straight through. Some of them are are just uh, you're rusting and, and you're causing staining on on the uh, on the on the siding or stucco. These these should be replaced at the time of the siding project. You can also begin to see rust on the on the the flues that the the B vents there, and the flues. Um, these should be addressed. All all any type of um, flue that has rust on it should be addressed during a roofing project because the one thing you don't want is to go through all of this and then to look at some rusty vents on top of your roof so they should be touch sanded and, and then repaint it with a with an like an aluminum paint to um, to 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 look good to look like new so here's an example of um this is a stainless steel chimney chase cover this uh this one you won't be replacing anytime soon after you know usually with chimney chase covers you'll replace them once and then as long as you pick the right material you won't be replacing it again then there's the brick chimney caps. Uh, a lot of times the weather ones will start to look like this, where you're going to have to uh, chip off all of that uh, mortar on top and patch it again with the new new mortar. And then we we uh, usually specify an elastomeric system on top that's reinforced with the mesh uh, to completely seal that new uh, hydraulic mortar that's on top. And then you'll it'll end up looking like this and last you for years. It's also a good time if the brick is in bad condition to repoint the brick while while they're doing this. So this is a, a B vent. It's usually from a furnace. And as you can see on this one, it was touch sanded and spray painted with an aluminum paint. So at the end of the job, you have a nice looking B vent instead of a rusty one. Now this, this picture is showing a couple things. It's showing um, attic fans. Uh, this has this roof has an attic fan in the center and then two what we call static vents on either side. So there's no mechanical fan in them. They're just vents. They're mushroom vents. Um, so like GAF, like a lot of manufacturers, don't like the mix and matching of um, exhaust types. So they'll usually recommend you to um, to get rid of the attic fan and just rely on the passive venting. That is a decision, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll, it may affect the warranty if there's an issue that occurs at that attic fan. But, um, you know, there, there are pros and cons to that. And uh, 
you know, many, many communities will just, uh, you know, require the removal of all attic fans and then just rely on the passive venting. This way, there's no issues with the warranty down the road. This roof also has satellite dishes. Now, they make special mounts for satellite dishes. Um, so you won't ruin your warranty by screwing right through the shingles. And the problem with that is, here you can see on the right, the the satellite dish mount was installed by the roofer. The satellite company came back and totally did not put the satellite dish on the mount. So this is a problem and has to be corrected. Satellite dish company has to come out and remount it on the mount. And the roofer will probably have to come back and replace some sh shingles at this point. Skylights and cathedral ceilings. Usually where there's a skylight, there's a cathedral ceiling. Um, now, the reason I, I bring this up is cathedral ceilings are, you know, if they're if they're built back in the 80s, there, there's no baffles in them. So the insulation is there and they may not be breathing properly. So you may have to open them up and put baffles in almost. It, sh it should actually be checked and see if there's room for, for the airflow. If there isn't, then baffles have to be put in. And then most skylights, if they're of that vintage, need to be replaced after you know 20 years uh, because they're probably leaking or they're going to be leaking. And then the newer uh, the newer skylights are, are have better flashing kits that come around them. And you don't want to go through all this work and then not replace something like a skylight because they really don't cost that much. So here's an example of a cathedral ceiling. As you can see, uh, baffles are being installed. So at the end of the day, you have a um, you have a, a nice clean roof. This shows the ridge vent at the top, and nice uh, chimney chase covers that re were replaced, and you have a nice roof um, all ready to last you for another forty years. And that is it. I ran over a little bit, but. Uh, I will um, take a look at uh, the questions. I don't see any more in the chat right now. Okay, so like I mentioned before, the code is drip edge. And if you have any particular questions about your particular project, feel free to call us at the office. I'm always available to talk to someone. Um, we can even come out, look at your community give you a proposal for for any type of roof inspection work you need or roof specifications you need uh, uh, mark i have one question i don't know if this is uh something you can speak about um but wayne asked uh, if we can speak about the uh, gaf solar shingles right so i've come across uh, the, the gaf solar shingles on a number of projects where it was looked into but not acted upon the problem with associations ends up with uh, who who will derive the benefit from the shingles and, and the solar power. So that always ends up being the sticking point and then um, and then and then the association usually says that they're just going to go ahead with a with a regular roof replacement program. So I haven't actually been on a project yet where we actually use them. I'm aware of them. I've actually um, um, did some proposals you know, that included them, but haven't actually been in our installation yet. It seems to be good. You know, if it was a single family home, there's, you know, it's, it's an easier decision making process for associations because who owns the roof? And then you have a unit owner that may want to put solar up on the roof. It becomes a very complicated issue. Um, the only time I've seen something work, would, would, you know, something that may work is, you know, if it's on a clubhouse and then the association owns the roof and then deriving the benefit from the solar panels. But even then, I haven't seen any, it put on any clubhouses yet. Okay, great. The, yeah, no other, no other chat uh, questions. Oh, wait. Yeah, the, uh, that G, yeah, that, that GAF product that we're talking about actually is in replace. It actually replaces the shingles. 
So it acts as the water barrier, which would be the shingles and the solar panel. So um, that's the product that they have. And it was actually, you don't put it on top of shingles. It actually replaces the shingles. If you need more information about that, we're, we're glad to provide it to you. But like I said, we don't, we don't really have any direct experience with actually installing it yet because uh, none of the projects have actually gone through. And then one more, if we have time, uh, pros and cons of metal roofs. Well, metal roofs are going to be expensive. Um, uh, there's uh, there's the two types, the aluminum and the the galvanized roof that has a, a Kynar finish. They both will have a Kynar finish on them. So they're long lasting. I, I've done a few metal roofs. The only thing you have to watch out with them is, um, you know, snow buildup because you will need the snow guards on them. They are expensive. You will need special detailing. You'll need the higher temperature underlayments. Um, but they last a long time. If you go with the galvanized, there there may be some maintenance down the road, you know, after maybe 30 years where where you might get some, you know, rust start in the form. So I usually spec out the aluminum version of it with the Kynar finish because then there's you don't run that rust down the road. But then again, there is there is cost involved with that. All right. It looks like that's it. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to give us a call at the number uh, on the last slide that Mark has up. Um, my email is also in the chat. If you want to shoot me an email, I can always get an answer from Mark and, and connect. Um, but thank you all for coming this morning. All right. Thank you, everyone. Great job, Mark. All right. Bye. All right, bye, guys.